thing are kind of like bait to the artistically concentrated mind, considering they so consistently lunge into the unfamiliar. Like, they certainly march down their own perplexing avenue off the bat in 2013's Mid-City by plopping together sections of splintery noise and gangster rap, then continuing to fill its spaces with samples that captured the shabby wreck of a decaying city. 2014 self-titled certainly deepened their lyricism's personal slice with things like the grim extremes to labor and promiscuity, despite the production and hooks being a bumpy rise. Splendor and Misery peeled things back to these ambient scapes that were either like puffing dust where granular tidbits of noise would hit you in the face, or had a thunderous buzz that felt pulled from automated machinery like engines revving, warning signs, and etc. And after these synthesized into a boiling darkness, a selection of spirituals were added, which insinuated desperation for help from a higher power, which made sense considering the album's setting was on a spaceship housing a slave in captivity. The story followed no clear timeline, it was like its ends were supposed to remain untied, but really what made its magic get under my skin was focusing on its grand, in the clouds poeticism foremost, then lacing the fable in second. The vessel itself suggests suffocation in 21st century civilization. Diggs alludes directly to commonplace mental crises and life obstacles, and where his deadpan rapping darts off speedily, I picture he's trying not to be swallowed up by the dark smoke of humanity, just calling out for something, anything real to grasp onto. Delivery-wise, his cold shoulder to conventionality makes his presence scream creator over rapper. He has this drained cadence, but explores different movements, like falling into a mind-numbing fatigue, packing together tensity, or babbling sardonically. His voice is always a tool. Anywho, the protagonist within this story sinks into the haven of trying to wrap things away, to snarkily comment on it all from the outside. He relies on it to save his life, really, and it feels like an eerie hint towards Diggs's incentive and devotion. I suppose there existed an addiction to blood. Hits less like an existential fight because it knows its place, it lost before it started. Really, it's a gradual chase down by addiction and temptation of many forms and of death, as explained through the lens of a horror film. It's produced with these distorted bits that are like falling on coarse concrete and these earthly rushes of night air, especially in a track like Run For Your Life, which takes you to a brisk city chase at 3 a.m. where the ambiance wavers in and out like wind in your face as you run. It pulls in snippets of soft, powdery ammunition and even recordings of things like cars passing by with music on and neighborhood dogs barking. The ambient sections tend to forebode like a sci-fi score, and I will say that now and again the digital loops seem like stock instruments no more sculpted than their state at the drawing board, but usually sound contextually artful. The production's filled out just enough without tipping into more or less than is needed, but really this album aims to form a mutual understanding between Diggs and the listener that your place in this green earth is nowhere. It materializes the left and right images in his brain of gore, of suffering, the reminders that we're all essentially disposable pieces of me, and that both the universe and world leaders pay no mind to the ins and outs of our stories, or like gadgets to propel their interests. I mean, he dead comically cheapens the weight of decease. It's oh he did sounds like a tease from one of your bros after you lost in a video game, and its stark contrast with the lyrics and soundscape foreboding doom makes it hit that something is unsound or defective here. The show is the album's most bluntly graphic cut, illustrating the bodily details of execution without obvious rhyme or reason. It's purely merciless and inhumane until for a second it pokes out of this pit to critique the apathetic rhythm of day-to-day -day life in the first place. And in a separate second, you're tricked into a tiny spark of warm humanity by a reference to the victim's favorite film as a comfort source. It connects a personality, a backstory to a corpse from a wider scope issue, and how all these many details of someone's design just disappear in a flash. They're burned into dust that dissipates into the air. Club Down's hard as nails chorus nudges towards the commotion of a public shooting, and production-wise, it's like underneath its sand-like distortion, those gong punches and buried screams suggest this is the moment the world caves in. Though it also examines thoughts on desensitization to gang culture, which run through the album in general and fuel the entirety of La Mala Ordina, 
though it's applied with more traits of traditionalist hardcore hip-hop with drug and gun infested language from the features Diggs repeatedly romanticizes homicide as an art form and sketches out real-time events as if they're plot stages. Just as crafty is the exhaustive application of distortion to close it out, it's like it's being attacked from an outside source. It feels like a bizarre move. Few people would go there, it's commendable for that, but I'm not entirely sure whether it helps or hurts. Although the same technique crunches over top a gospel hymn at the end of All In Your Head, and I can buy into the decision more here since the cuts, lyrics, not only deem religion hollow, but liken it to possession, and this simulates being swallowed up in a similar way. And one thing that boggles my mind about this record is how the loudmouth sass of deliveries like La Chats and Counterfeit Madisons and Robin Hoods fit in so snugly and mingle comfortably with the sound. It's like they allude to someone Diggs would perceive as overzealous with expectation in relationships and you can picture how they would damage the dynamic. It reminds me of the dehumanizing satire of He Dead, but readjusted as now bodies are props to satisfy lust. Subtle implications of this are also woven through Story 7. Blood of the Fang is really the record's lone precious shred of motivation. Its lyrics and chanting rally a battle cry against systemic racism with concentration on police brutality and peppered in are nods to figures like Huey Newton, Malcolm X, Angela Davis, and George Jackson to galvanize into action. And finally, attunement suggests that being alive is like being dragged by the neck, you're expected to hang by a thread and bear all the torment when nothing goes far enough to kill you, yet that ritualistic Asian stringed instrument swells up with the scent of death, and ambiance bolsters it gradually until it's up on a pedestal. It's a richly conclusive moment. But in terms of my issues, because they do exist, um, first of all, the interludes, while they intersect with the record's theme, they kind of stick out like sore thumbs in the listening experience and really just shove me out of my lured headspace. Um, I'm not into piano burning because straight fireside crackles, uh, whether simulated or recorded, just make me feel like I'm listening to a relaxing sounds mix on YouTube or something, <laughs> especially when they're like this fucking ASMR and the length is just the icing on the cake. Uh, you're not gonna catch me bumping this one in the whip anytime soon. And occasionally, like I mentioned, a small component to a track's biology might feel a bit shabby, which depending on the day can be a turnoff. But besides that, I think clipping has given us much to chew on here. And really, you should arrive at your own interpretation because the meaning here is in your hands and you may as well capitalize on that. So I'm feeling like between a seven and an eight. Thanks so much for watching my review as always, and I'll see you next week or something. I don't really know. <laughs>